bit like uh, sort of buses that I've been waiting for an opportunity um, to talk about Upper Paleolithic and particularly open air sites with people for a very long time. And just like buses, you wait, in my case, 30 years, and then three or four come along at once. And I'm really very excited by the possibility of um, a whole lot of new work, uh, and, and in fact, uh, new people who will be doing this work, um, uh, you know, hopefully for, for many years to come. So anyway, um, I just wanted to start by saying a few words about um, the background to this. Uh, in, in the past, I think archaeological research into the late glacial Paleolithic has been very much uh, dominated by studies of caves and uh, rock shelter sites. Um, let's get this working. It's new technology for me. Yeah, it's obviously, yeah. Is it arrows down? Okay. Sorry. So, um, just to say that uh, this is a tradition, of course, um, that. Uh, is uh, very much um, uh, as a result of the wonderful work done by um, people like Dorothy Garrett, the first uh, female professor of archaeology at Cambridge University, and she uh, undertook a major study of the Upper Paleolithic in 1926, but it was uh, well, published in 1926, but it was completely dominated, of course, by uh, cave sites. And this work was uh, continued by John Campbell, down, seen down the bottom right, who published uh, a very um, useful review in 1977, covering the early and the uh, later Upper Paleolithic of Britain, and published by um, OUP. Um, and I claim to have some small contribution to this in 1986, Simon Colcutt and I undertook um, a major survey of cave sites for English heritage and Cadu at that time. And uh, we were able to show that um, out of 120 sites or so that we visited that were targeted of interest, that 80 of them um, contained evidence of Paleolithic activity. And this, of course, was followed by subsequent survey and excavation work. Um, I've only mentioned some examples here, there are many others, but um, one's in the Tor Newton Valley, um, in the Y Valley in South Wales, Stephen Green, Creswell Crags, and also particular studies of um, late glacial sites, late glacial um, cave sites like Goff's Cave, Haviland, and so on. So as a result of this, um, we know quite a lot about the caves and rock shelters of Britain. And of course, we also owe a great debt of acid, uh, gratitude to Roger Jacobi, um, who produced some absolutely fantastic work and uh, was a, as a, a great colleague and a friend. And he was able to show that um, uh, through a, a magnificent um, dating program that he carried out with uh, Tom Hyam and others at Oxford, he was able to produce uh, a large number of radiocarbon dates on modified bones from caves and rock shelters. And I think he's generated one of the best chronologies or chronological records of um, the late glacial period, probably anywhere in Europe. Um, and this is some of the examples here. King Arthur's cave on the left-hand side. There's more work being undertaken here that, uh, that we might hear about today in, in Goff's cave. But this this conference, this day meeting, is pr uh, primarily about open air sites. And um, I think, as a result of the focus, our focus on caves and rock shelters, we've tended to play down or, or give less attention to to open air sites, unfortunately. And this is rather surprising in a way because, as a result of survey that uh, Simon Colcutt and I carried out. In fact, we only identified 63 late glacial caves in England and Wales. And as we know now, and we probably uh, knew then, there were many, many more 
uh, open air sites of the late glacial period, uh, dating uh, to between about um, 15 and 11,700 uh, calibrated years ago. So it's always been known that we've got huge numbers of open air sites, but they've really been a sort of poor relation of, um, of the cave sites. And so this meeting really is to try and redress the balance and just to remind ourselves that in areas where we don't have caves, and even in areas where we do have caves, we also have large numbers of open air find spots. And of course we shouldn't really be surprised about this because um, the majority of sites from this sort of period in Europe um, are open air sites. They come from major river valleys of the, the Rhine and the Somme and the Seine. Um, and uh, if you just look at the distribution of those sites, you will see that um, it, it really ought to come no, as no surprise because we've got a, a good land bridge connection at that time with Europe that there ought to be uh, sites, many more open air sites, uh, to be discovered or, um, shall we say, to be properly reported in the east of, uh, of Britain. So, um, one of the objectives today is to sort of, as it were, highlight or to showcase some of the sites that have recently been discovered, these um, it's equivalent of these three buses that you wait a very long time for them to, to roll up, and uh, these are three of the sites that will be mentioned today. But really what I'm hoping for, apart from um, a, uh, a good discussion and understanding of these particular sites, is to think about the context. Uh, for example, we can suggest a number of themes for today's meeting, and I hope everyone will get involved and feel free to contribute in the discussion. We've left a lot of time, left a lot of time aside for discussions. Um, and one of the things I, want, I hope that we can look at is how uh, the landscape um, influenced human behavior in, in the last, uh, in the late glacial. Um, we can look too at this question of the functional relationship between caves and open air sites, something that hasn't really been looked at in enough detail yet. Um, and we're lucky enough to have some people here who are working on very big projects, both in Britain and Europe. So the map taken uh, from uh, Vince Gaffney's group to work on the submerged landscapes of the, of the North Sea. And we have very big terrestrial um, surveys that have been undertaken by Philippe Crombe. And um, we hope to hear more about those today and lessons that can be learned um, in Britain from these, these bigger projects. And finally, I suppose to think about future management and conservation issues uh, affecting the, late, uh, the last glacial, late glacial um, archaeology. Um, how, how do we serve the interests of the major stakeholders involved in uh, long-term research, but also in preservation of these buried landscapes? So these are some of the things that I hope that we can um, develop and discuss in this meeting um, to think about the future, but also to think about landscape in a much more general sense than perhaps we've done in the past by looking at individual sites. So uh, although we've, we're ahead of time, uh, I think it would be uh, good at this point to hand, if I could hand over um, to Matt Pope, who will be chairing the uh, next session, which will involve two papers. Um, so thank you very much.